Okay, hello everyone. Uh, so, yeah, today we will continue to talk about um, visualizing neural function. Uh, so the previous uh, Q&A session is quite relevant. So I think it's, it's useful to understand uh, what the, our uh, technology for visualizing neural function. So today uh, we will uh, talk about techniques uh, following a last uh, time, which was we talked about static measures of activity and function and visualizing dynamic neural activity, especially uh, voltage uh, sensors. So now I think we will be discussing more popular technique about calcium sensor, which is called calcium sensitive dyes and genetically encoded calcium indicator. But the question about difference between the diet and genetically encoded uh, indicator uh, from the voltage sensor actually applies quite similarly to calcium. So that uh, makes sense. And uh, we will not talk much about synaptic transmission sensor because this is about like little synaptic transmission uh, with the FM uh, no, dyes and synaptofluorine. Uh, we will not be discussing too much, but uh, you can read it from the uh, text. Uh, the, the next thing I want to focus with you to discuss is uh, how to visualize the function of protein in neuroscience. So uh, we can use a reporter genes, which we can tap with a fluorescent protein so that we can trace down the movement of proteins inside a living neuron. And there are a bunch of uh, new techniques. Uh, these are very important and, and advanced techniques uh, for this uh, neuroscience study. So I want to expose you and make you understand about a number of these techniques called uh, FRED and BIFC and FRAP and photoactivation and photoconversion. Uh, in fact, a number of these new techniques actually allowed us to make a new uh, ways of looking at uh, the you know, biological system. So these actually led to a number of new Nobel Prize. So I will be discussing about this, how technology actually advances our understanding of the biology. So first let's talk about calcium, uh, especially intracellular calcium. So calcium or calcium ions are very, very important in cellular physiology. So these are, this is central to many physiological processes, uh, especially in neuroscience. For example, neurotransmitter release uh, from this uh, you know, synaptic terminal, the calcium ions are very important in the wild. Uh, you probably heard the calcium influx through channels. And also ion channel gating, calcium ions are very important. In general, a cellular signaling pathway uh, calciums are important for a second messenger pathway. So this is a broadly very important. So we use a calcium as kind of a uh, surrogate marker for neuronal activity. Because the neuronal activity in the end, we are caring about sub-threshold or uh, action potential of this membrane potential changes and propagation from one neuron to the downstream neuron to form a circuit in which eventually lead to a behavioral changes. So the calcium dynamics uh, can link these electrical activity of neuronal firing and biochemical events in neurons such as a neurotransmitter release and chemical synaptic transmission. So changes in calcium concentration is very important can uh, Let's see, Sumyong can directly indicate or uh, indirectly. Exactly. This is an indirect way to see changes in electrical activity because a neuronal action potential and transmission is about electrical activity. So, how can we represent this calcium? concentration changes using imaging. So we usually see changes in fluorescence. So we are using fluorescence for observing uh, the calcium concentration. 
And however, fluorescence intensity, I don't know how many of you have actually using fluorescence, but fluorescence is not by itself that quantitative. Because if you use fluorescence microscope, you will realize by using a camera, when you, whenever you take pictures, depending on the exposure time, there will be background noise, okay? So fluorescence itself is not easy to work with for uh, quantification. Well, it's an you know, excellent technique, very specific, uh, but fluorescence intensity is great, but it also is subject to many artifacts. That's what you have to actually understand and master when you're working with fluorescence imaging. For example, if you sh want to have a better signal, so you give a more shining with the excitation, high excitation power, then you realize why the overall signal are keep decreasing over time. That's called photo bleaching. So that's like unnecessary um, to have a high uh, signal. You are actually uh, losing a real fluorescence uh, by bleaching effect. So there are a number of things you have to understand to make your fluorescence imaging uh, proper. So on the other hand, so the other technique to utilize this is called ratio of fluorescence intensity over time. So this fluorescence, the background might be changing. So if it's a good idea to make what are the background level? And then you see the changes over time and then you normalize based on that background level. So normalize to initial levels of fluorescence. This is a way so normalization can be utilized to make your measurement more quantitative. Okay, so we discussed about voltage sensitive dye imaging last time. Um, and I discussed that, hey, voltage sensitive dye imaging is a pretty fast, it detects fast, but you remember the signal level is about point, the signal, I mean, the changes of in the fluorescence is the level of like less than 1%, say 0.1%, which is one out of thousand changes. That little change have to be detected and have to be analyzed. So you need very good skill to how to minimize the background, how to amplify your signal. Sometimes you have to do a lot of the same repetition of trial so that you can accumulate that little signal to noise ratio can become bigger and bigger to be detectable. However, now we are talking about calcium imaging, a larger and more robust visible signal changes can occur. So this is a great um, uh, achievement for like, you know, scientists make a uh, indicator for calcium. So now we are not talking about like less than 1%. Even look at this, DF, changes in fluorescence over the initial levels of fluorescence. This relative change is, can even be bigger than 1% and even up to 20%. This is a huge signal to analyze. So, you see, this is much easier compared to uh, voltage uh, sensitive dye. However, there's always things you are losing. It. So we talk about synaptic transmission, neuronal activity, but you, we use a surrogate marker as a calcium transient. And in reality, this actually takes a longer time, okay? So, but with lower, uh, let's see, Joey, voltage sensitive dye is about one millisecond order. You know, remember the timing diagram of action potential is order of a millisecond. To understand that event, we need to use like a thousand frame per second, which is very challenging. So a calcium case, it actually is the- It's a temporal resolution. Exactly. It's not that fast, tens of milliseconds. So what does it mean is, let's say there's one action potential, like one peak, okay? But if we use a calcium imaging, that one peak has a long tail, okay? Extending like tens of milliseconds in more practice, maybe hundreds of milliseconds. So that means 
if there is a more closely um, happening action potential events are there, you may not be able to resolve it clearly. So that's some caveat you have to understand by having higher signal, but there is also a little bit of a limitation. So I brought this uh, a picture for a uh, calcium indicator dye. So I'm not talking about genetically encoded, but I'm talking about exogenous dyes you actually pour into the cells and tissue called the calcium indicator. And this is a, a, a very interesting ways of calcium indicator dyes, which is organic dye uh, that change their um, G again, SP trial properties with when bound the calcium. So look at this, depending on the calcium concentration over the wavelength, fluorescence excitation rates are different. G, can you guess what this is? Yeah, it's a spectra. Remember spectrum, okay? So these are spectrum. Uh, but important aspects of this dye are data you can see if there's no calcium, excitation is great at this wavelength, such as let's say 360, 70 over here. Okay. And then when you look at, let's have increased calcium ion concentration, how does it change? The excitation spectrum now is, looks different and the peak is here about 340 becomes bigger. What it means is when we use uh, excitation light at 340, the high calcium concentration will be well excited and give more uh, ex, uh, emission light. While, what about the other cell who has a very low intracellular calcium concentration, then you realize instead of 340, let's say available laser line of 380. So you, you shine with this light, then you realize the low calcium concentration cell has higher fluorescence excitation compared to with a, this 40 high calcium concentration. So by choosing two specific wavelengths of excitation, and you take images. And this A and B are actually those images. You know, if you look at it with the naked eye or raw data, it may not be obvious to you. However, by making a ratio of this at different wavelengths, such as 340 and 380, and you make a ratio, you will have an amazing contrast images you get. And you can say this black, dark ones are low calcium and then bright ones are high calcium. So you can actually see, uh, reveal the intracellular calcium level, uh, which look almost the same here, but you can actually see which ones have higher calcium concentration. So this is an amazing way, uh, you know, a very cool way to see the calcium concentration uh, in, in, inside the cell. So uh, how we do it? So, the cells were dividing at the time of injection. And in this case, then you can watch this. In this case, we did a, a kind of ratio metric analysis, okay? But it can be some other dyes are just, you, you pull the dye, the dye gets inside the cell and wait for uh, the calcium ion. They grab the calcium ion, they have a more fluorescent. So that's a non ratio metric. Just give a higher signal when there's more calcium uh, around. Okay, so that's what I will be discussing next um, uh, page. But here I want to just point out that this ratio metric imaging, while this is more complicated, why sometimes people want to do it is because this one uh, basically depends on the sensitivity of uh, this specific fluorophore to specific environmental factors, they change their spectrum. So we make a use of it. So for example, pH change, their calcium ion, or even one fluorophores are close to another one and threat, which I will be discussing that you can also use a ratio metric imaging. 
All right, so let's start with the ratio metric calcium indicator dyes. Okay, so dyes that are excited by or emit a slightly different wavelength. And that depends on the either free calcium or bound calcium. So depending on different calcium concentration will make different uh, spectrum, either excitation or emission spectrum. Then we can use this reporting changes in calcium ion through the changes in the ratio of fluorescence intensity at distinct wavelength. So those who will be actually performing calcium imaging will get familiarized with these uh, you know, specific dye molecules. So for example, FURA2, and this FURA2 is a, the one you see just the previous pages. So emission is at 510. So this is like uh, about a yellow, uh, yellow green uh, emission, but that emission is different depending on which wavelength you are being excited, such as 340 to 380, and you make a ratio of the fluorescence imaging. Okay. So in practice, uh, this has to be like switching to different light, uh, the light. So people use, uh, in fact, uh, xenon arc clamp, which is pretty expensive, because you have to have a quick changes in between these 340 and 380. You take two pictures, and then you, you analyze by ratio metric. So why? Why people want to do this? Uh, because it has a, a very important advantage of you can correct for background changes, uh, which is not related to calcium dynamics. So as I said, fluorescence imaging is tough. I mean, this is very cool, but making quantitative fluorescence imaging is tough. Let me tell you the reason why. When you shine a fluorophore, so for one single fluorophore, let's say, have a lifetime of they can be excited and they come down to ground state, they emit one photon. Let's say this is one cycle. For example, some molecule have only 50,000 times of this cycle. So emitting almost 50,000 uh, uh, 50, emission photons, then what do they do this dye? The dye die, literally die, which means it makes a covalent changes, then the dye is not the, the dye capable of fluorescing anymore. That state we call photobleached. Okay, so what if while we are doing this experiment, hey, yeah, calcium imaging, but uh, there's a fluorescence is lower and lower. If the dye is photobleaching, that can be a confounding factor. So you have to see, make sure what you are doing the signal you are getting is coming from calcium ion change or photobleaching. So this is a caveat. And by ratio metric, you can overcome this because it's a ratio metric. And another thing, and in practice is important is when you do fluorescence imaging, you have to shine light. But if you don't know about like how the light is uh, being um, illuminated, you can make an inhomogeneous illumination. What it means is when you shine a laser light, only the center is bright and the you know, edge is not bright. And of course the fluorescence will also come out similarly. And that's not due to calcium ion change. Okay. By ratio metric, you can compensate for that. But I'm talking about illumination of fluorescence. But on the other hand, uh, this is not genetically encoded. So how you, you put your dye into the cells or tissue, that matters because you will be, let's say, injecting the dye or superfusing the dye. Then, you know, sometimes the dye can be more in some place than the other, just for practical re reason. And it, eventually the place where the dyes, more dyes are there will fluoresce more. So that can be affecting your quantification. So I put as a non-uniform dye concentration. Now all these can affect, uh, make it difficult for you to interpret quantitatively. So that's why ratio metric calcium indicator method uh, can be very useful for that. Of course, what are the 
cost you have to pay. Hey, you have to take two pictures. You need to have two different excitation light illumination. That's more complicated. And you have to analyze it uh, by also you have to do some calibration to interpret your results. And apart from this, you have to think other problem, potential problem of uh, by, you want to watch the concentration changes of the calcium. Uh, so what you introduce is actually the dye which will grab the calcium, bind to intracellular calcium and make a, a contrast for you to image. But this, this act itself are actually, you are using the calcium inside the cell. So this itself may cause a problem or changes in normal homeostasis of calcium ions inside the cell. So that means, you know, to get a better signal, it may not be the best good idea to just give as much as possible for dye because it can interfere with a normal calcium physiology. So you, you have to make sure calcium homeostasis might not be affected. So dye indicators, which is supposed to bind the calcium ion, and you have to also ask question that may alter calcium homeostasis. And that could be also affecting your quantitative measurement. I mean, you, you always have to ask these questions when you do experiment. So like make sure what you are doing, you're obtaining your interpretation. Uh, always have some caveats. You have to address those. Uh, always keep it into your mind. So now let's talk about a more easier one, which is non-ratiometric calcium indicator dyes. What do I mean by that? That's the dye that report changes in calcium concentration like directly with excitation or emission fluorescence intensity. Okay, an uh, example is called the dye called the fluo a three or fluo four, which uh, my colleague said it's a super bright, okay? So, so this is very cool, why? It just increase the fluorescence emission with the calcium concentration increase. The only caveat is unlike uh, ratiometric, that relation may not be totally linear, but you know, it's, a, it's an increasing function in your like calculus, okay? Concentration increase probably to increase in fluorescence, or well, you may not be, make sure that it's a totally linear, right? So I give you this um, a picture of uh, emission spectrum, which shows that let's say this dye will be almost not giving any fluorescence with no calcium, but it gives a, this a nice fluorescent spectrum peaking like a, a, a little red or near infrared range. So it gives a lot of emission when it binds to calcium. Okay, so then you just give this dye to cells or tissues of your interest, uh, especially the dye can permeate into neurons and then it actually turn into calcium indicator and you can image them by fluorescence. So it's easy to use and it's, you know, exogenous dye is usually bright, higher signal to noise ratio, so easy to quantify. But you have to always understand that this measurement is prone to detect changes based on dye concentration. You know, the dye can be more here and less there. You, are, you don't have the control for that, uh, you may not. And also your experimental specific conditions affect all these conditions. So it's probably hard to calibrate in this way. So for this, I want to um, give you some idea. Uh, sorry, I actually made an, an add on another, another like contents which I'll be adding. So in the end, uh, what are our questions in neuroscience? So, okay, for example, I'm interested in social interaction and specific brain region, which is relevant to social interaction. I want to see what happens. Hey, these two male mice, when I put a female mice into the cage, well, they encounter in, in another, you know, you know, gender. And, and I'm curious what happens to this specific brain region when this male meets 
encounter with a female mouse. Okay, so I want to see at the cellular level uh, which neurons respond and how do they respond. Does it actually form a, any circuit for, let's say, like mating or something like that? So here comes a method, um, advanced method. Uh, for example, we can create a mini scope, a very tiny microscope, which actually our lab also made one. Uh, so how does it work? If you create a tiny fluorescence uh, microscope and you actually put this a lens called the green lens, which is a rod lens, you plug it into the region of your interest where the mouse already has calcium indicator there. And you have fluorescence imaging, you need to send an excitation light and dichroic emitter, and you need to obtain the image with the uh, camera. So now I'm talking about image. While this one is only about several hundred micron field of view, but that's enough to observe hundreds and thousands of neurons in the field of view simultaneously so that you can actually watch while the animal is behaving, encountering social interaction. On real time, you see which neurons are flickering and which neurons are actually connected to you know, sending signals back and forth or forming a circuit. So that's in vivo or micro endoscope. Let me tell you a, a practical issue for this. If this surgery, you know, you plug in uh, this one into the animal brain will cause inflammation. And over time, there can be a um, foreign body reaction, which makes this long-term imaging a little more and more difficult. So one of the reasons is this microendoscope, rod lens. Rod lens, the diameter is about, you know, even narrow one, it's about half a millimeter for the 500 millimeter. You know, when you plug in this, you will see a lot of capillaries are burst and causing bleeding because just this is too thick. So another way of looking at this is, hey, I actually want to see even deeper region of interest, then this becomes also a problem. Then instead of having a full image, I want to just have a bulk signal of collective neurons, uh, you know, calcium activity. So neuronal activity into the calcium. I want to just observe that one into this focal area. Then you can just use a single fiber, which can be narrow as narrow as almost 100 micron thing is. So you can pluck that fiber and then use the same concept of fluorescence. So that is called fiber photometry. Okay, so then you can actually, you know, get insert into deeper or even multiple areas of your interest. So that's called fiber photometry. So what will be the signal out of this? You have excitation light and you just measure the amount of emission light. So it'll be a one dimensional. So this X axis is time and Y axis is the you know, normalized fluorescence. So you can give this uh, event and you can watch this G camp I will be discussing later, uh, the calcium uh, signals uh, and coming. So I look up like, hey, this has already been like uh, in the field for a while. So what's the most up-to-date one? So in Switzerland, uh, they actually publish a uh, nature uh, methods paper last year. Hey, this one is like, you see only one point. So how about seeing multiple points is a, a question. So they created so many of fiber optics together and they actually uh, think about which regions are interesting. So one, two, three, four, five, even 12, 24, even 48 fibers you can plug in to observe these multiple spots inside the brain simultaneously. So this came out in Nature Methods last year. So you see some of the limitations of fiber photometry may be overcome by looking at like designing properly the specific area you believe to be linked or connected. And you can see over time, this multiple calcium signals. So this is kind of state of the art. 
So I didn't talk about uh, like the GCAM. Now I will be talking about GCAM. So the story of GCAM or genetically encoded calcium indicator is like people now we can design uh, you know fluorescence molecule like such a GFP molecule to an interesting protein. You can make a fusion protein. Okay. So now I'm interested in calcium ions. So there, there's a calcium binding protein inside. And very interestingly, some part of this is once it binds calcium, they actually change their shape. Okay. Let me use, utilize this. You know, changes in shape is called conformation change. And then I want to see this guy. So I develop putting a GFP, which is a green fluorescent protein, which is not active at the beginning, but by binding calcium ion, it changes its shape, conformation changes, make this GRP to be active. So it becomes a bright green fluorescent. So this is a key idea originally came out from a Japanese group in 2001. Now, the Janelia Farm Research Campus in US, uh, Virginia, make many versions. So you will hear a lot of uh, the number. You can one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, even I think nowadays eight. Okay, it's keep increasing. So here's the concept. GFP molecule is inactive and there's a Kalmodulin molecule and there's M13 um, peptide sequence. Once calcium ion comes to bind, then they change their shape and GFP become active. So this is great way because normally it's dark only when there's a calcium ion binding, there's a fluorescence. Okay, so that's the uh, principle uh, we are utilizing endogenous calcium binding proteins when they bind to calcium. So that's called GCAMP and the name comes from GFPG and the CAM is coming from Carmodulin, which is uh, okay, here, a calcium binding protein, it's endogenous one, okay? And we have a fusion protein of this GFP and Carmodulin protein, calcium binding. So that's why this name comes from GCAM, this is Carmodulin binding protein. And you can even consider, what about red fluorescent? Okay, yes, there's R camp too. Okay, so the principle is when calmodulin binds to calcium ion, a conformational changes causing increase in GFP fluorescence. So as I said, there are a number of updated versions keep coming out and you know, modern G can, can now report neural activity of a, a single action potential. That's super high sensitivity. And even it can reveal even no action potential, but sub threshold neuronal activity can be detected because it has such a high uh, sensitivity. Okay. So, and in even not only cell body has a lot of volume, but you know, the dendrites and axons has a little volume compared to cell body. And even though synaptic terminal processes, you can actually watch. So this is a, a, an amazing advancement which visualize the calcium ion change, which is uh, a substitute for neuronal activity. So I put this uh, table for you uh, for the future. I'll just uh, point out something, uh, the key part for you. For this sensitive dye, has a high temporal resolution, but the signal is like one over a thousand very, very tiny signal. Genetically encoded voltage sensors are available, which is great because it has target specificity, uh, but it has a high background. And non-ratio metric calcium indicator, so it's a dye, organic dye, such as fluor 4, is great because it's so bright, uh, it cannot be calibrated. So only the ratio metric calcium indicator dye, you can calibrate in vitro by using two different uh, spectrum and ratioing it. So, such as a FIRA2 that enables a calibration, then you can at least say what is the calcium uh, ion uh, concentration in millimole. 
okay? Uh, GCAM, such as genetically encoded calcium sensor are great because this is now using transgenic animals and by using this transgene, you can actually target specific neurons. So it gives us a specificity and you know, the advancement make this one very bright. All right. So now I'll talk about protein function. So using fluorescent proof to track S cellular localization of proteins over time. Now we are talking, looking inside the cell, okay? And you want to detect interactions between multiple proteins. So I'm talking about even pioneer uh, area. Eugene, can you guess what this? Exactly. So we are talking about inside the cell, subcellular compartments. You know, from cell biology, you understand how protein is being made. So once it's transcribed and translated, uh, then it has to go through a number of these uh, sick, uh, pathways inside uh, sub cellular, subcellular organelles. And some proteins are exocytos to come out as a secretory pathways. And, and those inside the neuron can be studied by this visualization technique. So there's a number of interesting methods. Uh, first, time-lapse imaging with the reporter genes so that your interesting proteins movement inside the cell over time, you can actually watch. Another one I want to introduce is a very clever technique of how protein A is actually interacting with protein B with limited resolution of our optical microscope. You think about protein size is about less than 10 nanometer. It's a tiny. Your optical microscope resolution is, let's say, at least several hundred nanometer. You're talking about less than 10 nanometer protein, but you take it image, it will be like this boom, this big. And so it's actually not very easy to co-localize or to know these two proteins are actually engaged and interacting. So this is technique to resolve that issue. And another cool technique is called biomolecular fluorescence complementation. The idea is very simple. Uh, so even like uh, uh, Dr. Jin Hyun Kim who made the nature methods uh, out of this technique. So I want to see uh, neuron A's synaptic terminal and presynapse of neuron B, whether they actually interact, make a synapse or not. A good way is give this neuron half of the GFP molecule, which is useless by itself. Give another neuron another half of GFP molecule. So when they actually meet together, they form a complete GRP, then they fluoresce. So you can make a real fluorescence only when these two neurons make a synapse and physical interaction. So that concept is this BIFC. And this one, the other one is more like physical process that you just utilize and I said bleaching is a bad thing because it decreases your fluorescent signal, but there's a clever way. That, hey, can I use this? Yes, you can do it. You just use strong laser light to kill all the fluorescent in one area. And you want to observe how this dark area are recovering and that recovery contains uh, dynamics of these fluorescent molecules either inside the cell or on the cell membrane. So that's one. And the last one is photo activation and photo conversion. And this is the technique which led to 2014 Nobel Prize in super resolution microscopy. Not directly with this, but the idea has been around only after this photo activated fluorescent protein is becoming available in 2002. And we can utilize this to create tens of nanometer super resolution microscopy. And that led to a revolution in our imaging ability, not just typical hundreds of nanometer resolution to now order of difference, tens of nanometer. You know what recently what happened? Even we are talking about two nanometer resolution, okay? So 
that's another very cool trick. And so I want to discuss this one very lastly. So first about time lapse of reporter gene. So this is a neuron and I'm interested in uh, the organelle transport within the neuron along this uh, you know, neuride. So all the endosomes are green and I want to see migrating neuron expression. So how can I do it? Endosome itself does not give any contrast. So you design your fluorescent molecule to make a fusion protein with the GFP and you watch. So fusion of fluorescent reporter gene to a protein of interest, in this case, early endosome. Then you can see these dots. They are the endosome. And over 0, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 minutes, you see how these endosomes are working along this uh, axonal track. So that's very interesting and it's useful to localize a protein expression. And it allows observation of the location of this and uh, sebum. Can you guess? I think I already wrote it, so I, I, I don't think I can ask you a question. So it's a protein trafficking in live cells and tissue. But whenever you have a reporter gene, you also have to ask a question. Hey, is this, you are looking at fusion protein, not that protein, but the surrogate marker of green fluorescence. You're not looking at directly, it's kind of indirect, but uh, are, you, are we seeing, is it really true? You have to ask that question. So this fusion protein behave the same way as the original protein, always you have to ask, but GFP itself is actually not a very yeah, big protein, let's say compared to the protein of urine tract. But let's say protein is very tiny and you put the GFP a huge one and you're measuring the dynamics and changes, uh, you have to ask the question to yourself, what you are observing is a truly that tiny protein's behavior. However, over time, now we consider this a standard to study distribution and dynamics of many proteins of interest in living cells. Okay. But I have to say, even the cell physiology may change if you introduce like fluorescent protein. GRP is very stable and inert in some way, but other proteins such as red fluorescent protein, you have to make it bigger, right? You know, tetramer or dimer, it's bigger than, you know, sometimes you are changing the cell physiology. So you have to ask the question. It's great to have a tool to see, but you always have to ask what you are seeing is a truly the behavior and physiology what you are looking for. So now I'll be talking about again that uh, FRED. So remember from my microscopy lecture, as I said, if you have a flora, flora, flora four, which is let's say 10 nanometer size, okay? When you take an image with a fluorescent microscope, that looks like 300 micron. So what happens is you are interested in protein A of let's say 10 nanometer size, protein B. So that's so tiny, my tip of this uh, finger. So you want to see whether they are interacting each other or not. The problem with this fingertip, when you take an image, the size is like this and this. So when these two proteins are close enough, but not interacting, no relevance, but when your image look like this, oh, your interpretation is, hey, they are overlapping, they are co-localizing. So I interpret it as these two proteins, they love each other to attach them and they are you know, actively interacting. But in reality, in reality, it's wrong. So how can we convincingly assay a proteins of interest, they are actually interacting or not? So here's the concept once you understand fluorescence. You understand fluorescence has a excitation spectrum and emission spectrum, and that's not like sharp. You see this, let's say this green color fluorophore has a excitation of this blue color and green. You see, they have an overlap, okay? So what happens is if you excite with uh, this blue light, then it will emit this red spectrum. 
I, uh, sorry, green spectrum. Let's consider another uh, fluorophore, which is this part. This fluorophore has an absorption spectrum at this, let's say, a green color, and then emission at this orange, uh, yellow color, let's say. So what's very interesting is that let's assume this guy and this guys are like two different fluorophore. And if they are close enough, what will happen? That's the question. Hey, this guy, you excite with a blue color, they will emit this uh, spectrum show, shown as a uh, green here. However, right next to it, this fluorophore is there. So when they start to emit this spectrum, you know, this spectrum almost overlaps with this red absorption spectrum. So instead of emitting light in this, it actually giving this so-called sub-excitation to this next fluorophore, it excites. So what happens in real result, this yellow fluorescence coming out. But what if, if there is no fluorophore like this, then you give this one, you get this green uh, emission spectrum. So that's very interesting phenomena. Only happens when these two fluorophores are very close to each other, with several nanometers on top of that. And this is amazing, uh, turn out to be amazing method to really make sure two fluorophores or two proteins are actually very, very close, truly interacting. Okay, that has been suggested by a guy named called Foster. And the field now, because it's F, we call it as a fluorescence resonance energy transfer to monitor, um, let's see, Hanjinu. Uh, interaction. Exactly, interaction between proteins. And so, two molecules of interest are labeled with different fluorophores. So now we are we're gonna uh, name these two molecules, okay? So emission spectrum of a fluorophore of this, as I said, this guy, uh, can you guess, you know, which ones are donor and which ones are like acceptor? Uh, first one is donor and second one is acceptor. Right, because this guy is accepting this fluorescence to use it as an absorption. So that's an acceptor. So when the two proteins bind even closer than several nanometer, the excitation of the first fluorophore results in the emission of the second fluorophore, which is acceptor. So if you look at this a more realistic, another data I want to show here. So for example, we have C cyan fluorescent protein YFP called the yellow fluorescent protein. And you know, this shows a realistic uh, spectrum. So this is good to know for you in a more practical sense. Look at this C, absorption spectrum looks like this broad and emission is also broad and the peak is here. So that's why it's cyan color. And YFP has an absorption at peak at about five, 10, 15 over here. And emission is like a little bit uh, stock shift a little bit longer, so that's yellow. What happens if a cyan fluorophore is excited, then emission to almost overlapping with this absorption of YFP. So that's why when they are too close together, it can excite YFP. And you look at this excitation absorption of cyan is almost non overlapping with the emission of YFP. So you can measure the amount of emission of cyan versus yellow. And that ratio gives you a great idea of how many molecules are actually in close proximity. Okay, so this is a little more inside I just want to mention so you understand physically what's happening. That is called the FRAD efficiency. Uh, you can define as a donor fluorescence versus acceptor fluorescence. And that is FRED efficiency. Efficiency is very high here when they are very close, but when they are becoming farther and farther, then it will be dramatically decreased. So you can actually have 50% transfer efficiency at one R zero. 
So that zero is about seven nanometer order. So this is about distance, but in the fluorescence itself at the molecular scale, you can not only consider this distance, sometimes their orientation change also affect this threat because this is related to the geometry of these two molecules. Okay, so the application is uh, you can study interaction of signal molecules with their receptors and even distances like this and orientation between separate molecules. And sometimes you can utilize this as a substrate modification that leading to conformation change. As I said to you about GCAM, uh, a similar concept. So by inside a single molecule, let's say you want to see whether this molecule is conformation and change or not. Then you can have a donor here, attach acceptor here. And when they actually have conformation change, it fret, no fret, fret, no fret. This would allow a great tool for a single molecule study, such as you want to study, uh, let's say RNA polymerase, DNA polymerase, at the single enzyme activity you can visualize by using FRET. Uh, life science and you know some professors working in FRET to use this. Another one, uh, bimolecular fluorescence complementation. Uh, as I already said, you know, you can split the GFP in half and this is non-functional. Only when these two are close enough to make a form of, of fluorescence, then this is fluorescent. And you can utilize it for FRET as I just described. Okay, so by the name stands two molecular fluorescence are complementing each other to make a full fluorescent protein. So it's a similar to FRET uh, interaction and proximity of two protein of part of a fluorescent protein. However, the difference with the thread is you are not using a single fluorophore full, but two half, you cut it in half, okay? And they are split. And each of these are fused to one protein and does not fluoresce until these two proteins are in close proximity and they actually fall and form a, a fully functional fluorophore. Thinking about this, uh, this is a good way because fluorescence is in fact not very bright. The reason why we can detect is fluorescence has a, a very good low background. Like you watch the sky you know, twinkling in, in the sky, the stars, they are very dim so that we don't see it in daytime or at night when backgrounds are complete dark you start to reveal to see the star. It's like very similar concept. So this gives a very good um, sensitivity for you. All right. And I want to lastly discuss about fluorescence recovery after photo bleaching. Um, to give you an idea, I actually brought this new picture saying, hey, let's assume this is a, a membrane membrane, cellular membrane with uh, all the receptors labeled with the fluorophore. Okay, so initially like this is uh, all fluorescing and you shoot a laser at the middle and with a very strong pulse, then it will bleach, which means it kills the dye at the middle, so it's dark. But you are interested in movement of this fluorophores over time, it will start to dim. Why? Because the nearby a living uh, still available fluorophore starts to diffuse in over time. So that you can watch this uh, molecular scale diffusion uh, or dynamics by using this. So that's an idea. So now we move on to neuron. Let's say in neuronal surface, you are interested in the dynamics of certain kind of receptor molecules in the neuron. What you do, you shine, you kill fluorescence here, bleach, and then you watch the recovery usually forming like exponential recovery. And that gives us some uh, information. So we are actually utilizing photo bleaching to examine protein turn over rates or protein trafficking. So by strong laser pulse to bleach fluorescent molecule, we measure the time course of fluorescence which returns to the bleached region. So the kinetics of this tag 
protein is our interest, okay? Such as how well they diffuse along the uh, membrane, or if they don't move because they bind to something else, okay? Or dissociation, or sometimes the movement may not follow a pure diffusion process, or it may be active. So there could be an active transport into the bleached region so that by carefully analyzing and designing your experiment, it can reveal the underlying mechanisms of how these uh, proteins of interest are actually moving around uh, inside or on the cell surface. So for all these ones, I conceptualize probes for, for the activation of microscopy. In fact, this um, made the Nobel Prize uh, for high super resolution. So I give you idea, this active flow for you shine light. And as I said, you know, over a number of times of sending out fluorescence, it dies. It's called bleaching, okay? So this technique can be utilized and even more smarter ways. You design this fluorophore is in general inactive and you shine with a UV light. UV has a high energy, okay? Like will change this turn into photo activation. Now it becomes active fluorescence. Of course, you do it over time, you can bleach it out. Oh, another way is you change the state. So it's called photo activation. While you can have one photo fluorophore, which has the ability to change into another colored fluorophore. So it's originally green fluorescence and you give it strong UV light, which is a high energy and it switches it changes this uh, fluorophore fundamentally, then now it emits like red fluorescent. And then you keep, you know, you can bleach them out. So these are concepts of photo activation and photo switching, which can give you a very cool idea of experiment. Okay. So this is a uh, photo conversion. And this is a reference. You, I think you don't need to memorize all this name, but just the concept. For example, photo activation GFP made a Nobel Prize uh, called a palm technique because you have many fluorophore, you cannot see it because too many, you shine little UV light and only very sparse molecule turn into green fluorescent so that you can localize it in tens of nanometer scale. And K, is a Japanese word for maple tree. You know how maple tree works? The maple tree is this guy, once you shine UV light, they turn into red. So it's photo activation, okay? And I'm, I'm gonna talk about drumpa. Drumpa is a reversible. So it's a green fluorescence and you shine uh, with a blue color, it actually bleaches out. But when you shine UV light, it, it recovers. Okay, and another one is a photo switchable cyan fluorescent protein. So it's a cyan fluorescence. Uh, what's interesting is you shine UV, you know, high energy photon shine, shine. And what happens is this cyan becomes fluorescent green color. So that's very interesting one and a, a nice tool. So photo activation is uh, engineered fluorescent protein. They do not fluoresce until you give a UV light that photo activates the fluorophore. And that can be fused to a protein of your interest. Then you can actually selectively uh, select those protein to label and follow. So let me give you an example. Hey, in general, there are so many fluorophores, so it's hard to watch. Then you just shine one UV over here inside the cell, and then you see this molecules uh, move around. So that's what you can use for activation. So observe behavior or dynamics of highly abundant. If there are too many, very hard to see, like uh, Golgi staining, okay? There are many neurons, but you want to see the subset. So that example is Drumpa, as I said, reversible for activation by UV fluorescence, which quenches, uh, blue light quenches and UV increased fluorescence. And photoconversion, uh, similar to photoactivation, rather than activating non-fluorescent molecule, 
a pulse of light can cause fluorophore change in its emission spectra, one color to the other, another. So that's photoconversion or photo switching. So I, as I said, uh, when we can use this, to examine timing of protein behaviors. So before one color, after this, another color. So this is a, a maple tree. So it's named KEDA, a photoconvertible fluorescent protein that emit green, so it's all green, but you, you know, shine UV to some of this that those only turn into red fluorescent. Okay, so all of this I put as a reference of table. Uh, I'm sure in the future when you have time, uh, what I said is inside, so you can use this one. Let me summarize. So visualization method to observe neural activity and protein function is allowing us how proteins determine the properties of a neuron. Also, that leads how neurons determine properties of circuits and behavior. So this visualization of uh, the function or aspect of neurons and neural system is very important by studying these three markers, activity and protein function. And the last one I want to discuss is uh, manipulating neural uh, activity uh, next time. Uh, okay, so this is the end and I want to give you uh, two, two, three minutes for writing your Q&A. Okay, thank you for your attention.